Hello everyone and welcome to the latest of Field Fisher's uh, privacy webinar series. Today we're considering the role of the Data Protection Officer or DPO. My name is Hazel Grant, I'm the Head of Privacy here based in our London office and thank you so much for joining us on this session. Today I'm going to be your chairman and I will get to pose the difficult questions on this panel event. Now, at this point, I was due to say I am joined by my colleagues in the plural, Felix Vitton, and also Martin McElroy. However, due to a small technical problem, I am presently joined by one colleague, Felix Vitton. We're hoping that Martin will be able to join us shortly. So, um, before we go any further, let's uh, let's get Felix to introduce himself. Yeah, Felix. right. Uh Thank you, Hazel. Uh, thanks for the introduction. And yes, we are waiting for Martin. But um, I'm Felix Witten. I'm head of the technology and data team in Germany. Uh, I'm working out of Hamburg. And I've been data protection officer for more than 20 years of my life. I've been internal data protection officer and external data protection officer. Um, and this is a topic that's dear to my heart. And I look forward to talking about it with you, Hazel. Great, thank you. Hopefully um, Martin will join us. He works out of our Manchester and London offices and he has a unique position because um, bless him, he is not a lawyer working in a law firm and uh, therefore he does many things for us. He assists on our DPO engagements. He is also Field Fisher's DPO, so he gets to know quite a lot about what the firm does and also our clients. So let's briefly consider our topic. Um, the role of the DPO has been around for several decades. I know Felix will be able to tell us about that um, in some of his answers when he tells us what's happened in Germany. But this has gained additional importance following the introduction of the GDPR. So the questions that we're looking at are going to be some of the challenges that organizations face as well as their DPOs and look at the ways that those challenges are being addressed. We consider how the role of the DPO might develop in the future, some of the changes that are proposed and some of the impacts on the role, some of the regulatory investigations and how you deal with regulators. So for those of you who don't already, already know us, Field Fisher is an international law firm with offices in Europe, Silicon Valley, and in China. Our privacy team works across all of those offices. We are a collaborative team providing strategic and actionable privacy solutions. And I know you're gonna hear about that in this webinar. Turning to housekeeping, please do ask us questions as we go along. There's a question function on your screen. Uh, we will have some time left for this at the end, and hopefully we might get through a few questions as we're going through, so I will keep an eye on those. If there are too many questions and we run out of time, we will finish on time, by the way, uh, we will answer those questions by email later on. And later this week, we're going to send you a copy of the recording, so you, know, you can refer back to this or share this with colleagues. Uh, finally, please do subscribe to our blog and keep an eye out for more uh, webinars over the course of the next few months. Um, lastly, for those of you who are interested, we have an online um, data protection course called, called DP Fit, and you can find that over on YouTube. So let's make a start. Okay, Felix. This is this one's for you, as you well know. Uh, let's have a little bit of an overview of, you know, how, why, what, who is a DPO? What, what, what is this function? Where does it come from? Yeah. So this is mainly just looking into the law and the GDPR and what it says about the uh, DPO. It's not really going into the very practical work, which I'm, we're going to talk about later. So the DPO has been around. Well, actually, it's something that has been invented in Germany um, by based on a court decision, but also on the understanding that it's helpful to have someone who's actually uh, a privacy steward in the company. So when it was invented about 40 years ago, or the first time in law 40 years ago, the, the concept was that it should be a person within 
every company that's taking care of the privacy topics and issues rather than the regulator going everywhere. And so there is, and we'll talk about that as well, a certain link to the regulatory perspective, but it's a very, you know, the, the concept itself is an independent person within the company taking care of privacy. So that was the idea. We had that for a long time in Germany. And then when the GDPR came about, there was a lot of lobbying by hundreds of, uh, or thousands of uh, uh, German uh, TPS to make sure that this is part of the GDPR and um, by now uh, it is uh, it has been included in the GDPR and I just heard learned from the IAPP that there are more than 500,000 DPOs registered all across Europe so it has been a, a huge push towards this function when and so there are basically three questions that the law looks at first one is when do you need to appoint a data protection officer um, and I'm, I'm just going to touch on all those things briefly. I'm open for questions about it because there are a lot of discussions about each of those topics. In general, it's uh, the requirement to monitor data subjects. Uh, or the requirement comes about when you monitor data subjects on a large scale or you have a large scales of um, special categories of data, sensitive data. Um, and if, if you handle those, then you need to appoint a data protection officer. And um, this data protection officer can either be an internal or an external person. It can be a group data protection officer for uh, the entire group. So there are various ways of designing it. Uh, once you've met the threshold, you've got to appoint someone. And then we've got some local laws like in Germany, uh, where you need to appoint a data protection officer in any case if you have more than 20 uh, full-time equivalent uh, um, employees in your company. Second thing is, what is the position of the data protection officer? First off, the DPO has to be involved in all decisions regarding privacy in the company. He's got to be independent, and the independence is guaranteed by various safeguards that have to be in place, mainly there's uh, a reporting part uh, that's going along with it. Uh, the DPO has to report to the, as it says, highest management level. And uh, the independence is also guaranteed by a dismissal protection, which is beyond your normal employment dismissal protection. Uh, and the position also involves that there shouldn't be any conflicts of interest and we've re just recently seen decisions around the conflict of interest this is one of the hot uh, topics right now around the dpo legally what does it mean really to be independent and how do you, you avoid uh, conflicts of interest and the third one is what does a dpo do what are the main tasks it's really the information about privacy within the company including training uh, which is important but it's also the monitoring of the compliance um, and the provision of advice regarding any privacy related topics. Um, and if necessary, it's a cooperation with the, the supervisory authority when it comes up, then the, the DPO should be involved or actually handle this. Okay, thank you. I can see Martin has just joined us, but before I turn to Martin, um, a question occurs to me, Felix, and that is that um, when the, when dare I say it, for us, the DPO came in and it was a novel and new, new, new position. One of the questions that we were asked quite often was, you know, is, is the DPO effectively the regulator's spy on the inside? You know, is it their job to go and tell the regulator when something has gone wrong? Yeah. And uh, you know, historically, I have had this experience for a client in Germany where the regulator was told by the DPO that he or she thought something was really seriously wrong in that business. So what's your perspective on that? So there is no, uh, so while, as I said, it, it, it sort of includes certain regulatory activity or pushes that into the company by having a DPO, there's no requirement to uh, inform um, the regulator about anything, the, the role uh, by the DPO. So the role of the DPO is really warning and internally telling people, I, you know, potentially I would see this differently, but they, the DPO doesn't take the decision. Um, it's mainly, it's, it's just an advisory role. And they also do not have the obligation to inform the regulator if they feel uncomfortable with something. Uh, so it's, um, 
you mentioned that this happened to you in Germany. Sometimes some DPOs take their role a little too serious, particularly in Germany. So I'm, I do apologize for my fellow countrymen. Thank you. You're being very gentlemanly. <laughs> So um, I can just see there's one quick question which I will pick up here um, about the slides. Uh, this is actually a panel event, so we won't have slides, but there will be a recording. So um, that will be your, your record of what we've discussed. So Martin, let me turn to you quickly. Um, this is like a, a little bit of game of Mr. and Mrs, isn't it? Because I've introduced <laughs> you already and, and told oh, everybody what you do. So now you're, it's your opportunity to show me up as, as not knowing what you do. Um, uh, but anyway, maybe you can just give us a, a quick introduction to yourself and then sure. I'm afraid we're gonna have to turn to you for one of your questions. Oh, that's fine. I mean, firstly, can you hear me? I can. You can. You can see me. Uh, and I apologise to everyone. Uh, we, we were having some technical issues here in our Belfast office today, which uh, detained me. But, but yeah, thanks, Hazel, uh, for for the initial introduction. Yeah, I uh, my name is Martin McElroy. Um, I, I, I've been a DPO for officially, I think, for about five years. Um, but I've been around various compliance and privacy teams for, for a lot, lot longer than that. But probably not as long as Felix, I suspect. Uh, um, but yeah, I've um, I have the privilege of being Field Fisher's um, in-house DPO. Um, but I also work alongside Hazel and my colleagues within the, the privacy team um, on a, a range of DPO files where we act as uh, outsourced external DPO. So yeah, a lot of a lot of DPO uh, work in my life. Thank you, Martin. So, um, Martin, turning to you, we've had Felix give us a, a quick overview of, you know, the why, what, who, where, when of a DPO. Can you give us a, a sort of rundown of the frequently asked questions that you see as a DPO? How do you spend most of your time? And, you know, you can be anonymous when it comes to field fisher. You don't need to own up to how, how much time you, you spend on incidents yeah. in field fisher. Yeah. Every, everything's rosy here apart from the technology apparently so uh, uh, you know, it's it, it's a really I mean it is a really good question because it is it is you know a wee bit of a cliche but I don't I really don't think you know two days are the same usually so there's there is one of the nice things I think about this job is that it, there is a there's a lot of variety which um, you know I think keeps us all from being too bored but but I think there are there are some repeat questions repeat themes that, that, that come up from time and time you know time and time again um uh, you know in addition to you know some of the tasks i think I, I i caught felix outlining but but i mean the the one question that that keep surprises me at the moment really uh, is that you know what are we about four and a half years down the line from the introdu introduction of the gdpr and it, it keeps coming up for me at least in, you know in, in training sessions and, and and in discussion with you know clients stakeholders within clients and that is you know a kind of basic question of can i do X or can I do Y, you know, and that could be anything as simple as, you know, can I share personal data? Can I, can I implement this new system? Can I buy this marketing list? So there's, I think there's this kind of lingering perception that, that out there still that the GDPR is a bit of a blocker on, uh, on, on progress, on new technology and, and, and new developments. And whereas I think, you know, I'd, I'd like to think most of us on this call would know that, you know, most things are, are actually possible as long as the task um, you know, in hand or the new project complies with the, the principles of the GDPR, that there's, you know, you've got appropriate risk assessments in place and all the right accountability measures, et cetera. Um, I think it, it sort of points to a general um, uh, lingering kind of set of GDPR myths that it's it's there to stop things happening. So so that that is actually a question that comes up for me quite a bit. Um, aside from that, you know, I, I think you know the, we we will often get involved when when things go wrong. So often as a DPO, you know, you, you'll be asked to comment on whether um, the controller needs to notify a data breach. Um, and so, you know, as you might expect, the, the kinds of incidents that we get to comment on can be pretty wide ranging um, from the, the kind of more simple, if that's the right word, or standard kind of uh, missent email. Um, documents laptops being left on trains or or in or in, in bars in fact i have actually had a comment on one of those today um where uh, uh, documents were left on the train 
not food fisher i, I hasten that but uh, uh it's uh, you know it does it does happen routinely I, and then of course we you know we we we, we perhaps get to um comment on on much more sophisticated cyber attacks you know malware attacks you know successful phishing attacks ransomware and so on and and so typically you know we'll we'll be asked to give the controller an opinion on on the degree of risk of harm and whether or not a, a you know the controller is going to have to notify a supervisory a supervisory authority and then i suppose you know we would again typically get involved uh in supporting with that notification you know helping to prepare that um and and even even in the event uh, you know notification is required, sort of I guess constantly reminding the controller that um, you know um, that even if the the, the the incident's dealt with, that they've they've still got to maintain a log and record of the incident, um, you know, to to show their thinking and and of course to support the accountability principle. Um, and then I suppose outside of incidents, you know, it, it can be a little bit more random, but I, I would say like on a on a day to day basis, you know. You'll often get asked to to um, uh, give an opinion on a new project, um, you know. So whether whether or not you know a new project or a new processing activity needs a, a, a simple risk assessment or perhaps a full DPIA, and then of course depending on the on the answer whether or not um, you know if it is a full DPIA, then you know uh, of course as, as DPO we're obligated to review and uh, advise on those. And uh, yeah, outside of outside of DPAs, uh, you know we. We could be asked to review anything, you know, any data protection policies, LIAs, DPAs, TIAs. You know, I think basically anything with an acronym in it, uh, we we often get. Uh, You'll have it. We get, we'll have it. Uh, yeah. Um, and yeah, I guess uh, you know the probably the other the other area, of course, is is training. You know, we are. It's it's part of our role. It's uh, literally part of our job description, isn't it? I think in, in Article 20 or 39. Um, you know, to to raise awareness and and to provide you know training, um, and and help with communication. So, um, you know, and that, that that can take many forms. You know, whether it's a, mm -hmm. you know direct kind of um, classroom style sessions to you know helping prepare communications to send you know to the controller you know, to the business within the controller um, to the controller's business and uh, you know uh, uh, you know helping with. Uh, developing courses like online courses and the like you know it's um, it, it comes in many shapes and sizes so yeah it uh, never never a dull day i guess pretty varied indeed yeah so when we were preparing for this there was one question which i asked and i thought it was quite an interesting one so i'm going to ask it again and i think martin you and i have the same experience in that um if an incident we have no experience <laughs> <laughs> with no experience quite. <laughs> we we have not been in a situation where a, a client has had an incident and as dpo we have said we really think you know to need to notify and the client has said we really don't want to notify um but i think felix you may have had this kind of experience and I always think this is one of the tricky things so what do you do as a DPO in that situation where you your opinion is this is notifiable yeah first of all I'm not going to disclose who the client was but uh, I we, think that's we, very wise <laughs> right <laughs> yeah um, I'm glad but, you're not doing that <laughs> it would be a very fun story but anyway so no I'm not going to tell this but yes it happened um and, and it's, sometimes it's a difficult decision whether you need to notify. That's one thing, sort of, you know, yeah. a risk risk allocation where you say, yeah, you could, you don't really need to. It's sort of a borderline one. And and which direction do you go? Um, and the good reasons for going either direction is really uh, a case by case thing. The other thing is sometimes it's really obvious that you would need to notify. Um, and and, uh, and and as I said, we've had one case where the client said, "Well, so we're still not going to do this. It's, this is embarrassing for us. Uh, we don't want to uh, want this out there." Uh, and um, as I said, the DPO doesn't take the decision. It's uh, so. What I did in this case was just providing my view on this one and saying, "This is the reason why I think it would be actually a good idea." to notify, but if you don't do this, it's your decision and I'm out in, in this respect. So is this where it ends? You know, I, I, I added it to my list of interesting cases, but it's nothing else um, because there's not, it's not my decision whether to notify or not. 
So, so if that happens, it's really, in my view, it's really about providing a giving arguments to the management why they should take things maybe, you know, or reconsider. Mm. Uh, and um, also talking about why a notification may actually be a good idea, even if it's uh, not, um, it doesn't seem wise at the first time, particularly as it's often not so safe that this one doesn't come out elsewhere or you know somehow yeah. come uh, sees the light of day uh, may it be you know because one of the data subjects finds out or one of the employees who've been involved uh, mm -hmm. is is annoyed and then goes to the regulator and then the different you know you, you the difficulties you're facing are significantly worse uh, than if you had notified and 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 uh, also what we're seeing is although we're always very nervous about fines so far we have not really seen a lot. It's increasing, but we have not really seen a lot of fines around data breaches. It's uh, and most of them, you know, go very smooth. Speak for yourself. In the in the UK, we see loads of fines on breaches. <laughs> but yeah, I, I do take your point. It's it's so much it's so much better if if you, the controller, can manage the narrative and the story with the regulator and with the press, if it gets out there and with the data subjects. Um, okay, so I think the next point I wanted to turn to is, uh, you have this person, the DPO, who do they work with? Where do they sit in the business in order to best do their job? And you know, should it be internal, external? You know, what's the what's the driver for this DPO? Where, where's the best place? Where's the best function in which to put them? And I think Felix, this is one for you, and I'm sure Martin will have a few thoughts as well. Yeah. So traditionally, I see basically three areas where they're located, and and each of them has its advantages. It could be the legal department, could be within the compliance team if you have a dedicated specific compliance team, or it can be in the IT. Uh, so those work all quite well, depending on uh, well the skill set that the DPO has. So some of them are, have, more, have a, more of a legal background, others have more of a technical background, and that could drive where they actually are located. Certain areas do not work, or departments do not work. We've had a decision in, in Germany regarding a um, CEO of a subsidiary uh, doing this for everyone, and, and they actually have got, received quite a significant fine because the, this person was in a role that was not okay. Um, HR often uh, would also usually not be as good because you've got to avoid that they audit themselves and, and in HR there are a lot of issues. I also think, in my view at least, the CISO is not perfect for being the DPAO uh, because uh, a someone who's more on the security side has a conflict with privacy issues. Although those go in hand in hand, on the other hand, the inherent conflicts. Um, and so that, that's a difficult role to combine but I've, I've seen that as well and it, yes I know it's done it's just not optimal uh, so uh, I personally I like um, uh, the compliance part because I do think that's a good department to base it in but as I said legal or IT uh, are often you know, are also quite frequent and not bad ideas so okay. that's yeah. okay and Martin what do you think about um, you know where you position a uh, a DPO and, and maybe also we should touch on because we've we've mentioned it you know the internal external DPO what's the pluses and minuses of that from, yeah. the, from what we see from clients yeah indeed um, I mean on on the first point uh, yeah I, I would I tend to agree with Felix I think it's I'm probably most comfortable with DPOs being within compliance team or legal teams uh, mm. um, the, I, I have also seen the the kind of the this sort of shared CISO DPO role, which has always made me a bit twitchy, particularly, you know, as, as, as Felix alludes, there's a, there's there's that inherent kind of clash between, um, you know, for example, you know, the monitoring of of, of IT systems uh, versus you know the balancing that against you yeah. know, the, the the privacy concerns. So, so there's that. So yeah, like for example, in my in my role here at 
Field Fisher, I sit within our internal compliance team, risk and compliance team, and report into our risk partners uh, and onwards onto our supervisory board. And, and I think for certainly the most of the DPO, external DPO files that I work on, uh, we, we're mainly reporting into uh, legal functions or compliance functions, but with you know the the odd um, you know, report line and via HR or, or IT occasionally. So, so but yeah, I think it's mainly risk and IT or compliance and and, and legal, I should say. Um, okay. And in terms of the 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 kind of considerations around you know internal versus external DPO, I mean, I think I mean obviously we're we're probably slightly biased here, but I think you know, at least what we what we see, I think, you know, at least some of the feedback that I've seen from clients around uh, the considerations about, you know, going for an external DPO is, is quite often it's it, 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 there's there's a kind of practical element to it, and you know, I, I suspect most people on this call will will know just how hard it is over the last few years to actually recruit, you know, experienced privacy professionals and and and, and privacy lawyers and 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 to you know and to retain them and, and keep them in in those roles so there's there's that um there's there's also you know so, sometimes it is more cost effective depending on the on the model to to have uh, to have an outsourced dpo rather than um you know a kind of full-time uh, employee but i think you know th there is there's a perhaps maybe a, a kind of ethics type compliance issue here as well and you know a lot of a lot of clients like having that that degree of separation between you know them and their their day-to-day -day processing activities and and a, and an outsourced dpo which which provides a maybe an, an additional level of independence that that an internal employee you know could could bring so so i think it's it's, it's probably a mixture of of all of the above really okay felix what do yeah, you have any thoughts yeah yeah i'd like to add some some things so the first one is um martin is putting uh, looking at one important point it's really about the role of the dpo how you want to have the dpo uh, often the dpo is, is part of the in, internal privacy team sort of or maybe the person heading the privacy team and that's okay uh certainly you know that's one way of doing it some more advanced organizations sometimes have the dpo outside of the privacy team basically just uh, really auditing what the privacy team does. And um, that, that is uh, often a good idea. Sometimes it's really difficult. And I get a lot of complaints about, you know, by the privacy team that someone else is sort of messing with what they're doing. Uh, but it's, in, in general, that's another question around the setup. It's not just where are they, but how do you organize a DPO function um, within your uh, company and how independent are they really uh, and and so uh, uh, but the, the the other one around an external or an internal DPO uh, I obviously t take the view of the uh, external DPO know the advantages and disadvantages of it but the main disadvantage of an external data protection officer is a lack of knowing what's really happening in the company yeah. so um, you it's it's just if you choose to go for an external data protection officer then it's it's absolutely adamant to make sure that there's enough information flow to your external data protection officer otherwise they are just uh, sort of a waste of resource so um, i think if you get this one right and find a way to um, get the communication to the DPOs, that's good. And um, there are different ways of doing this and setting this up. You know, one key contact is most of the time the thing that works best, but there are other ways as well. It's just, um, I think that's quite important. And if you get this one resolved, then the advantages uh, of having an external data protection officer, particularly maybe the, the strong contact with uh, the regulator and the possibility to ask questions to the regulator regarding compliance without disclosing directly whom you're asking for. So that's sort of a way of doing this more anonymous. On the other hand, having a DPO doing this and um, and it's also uh, for smaller for a smaller setup, it's often easier just to have the know-how with the external data protection officer, all the training things, et cetera. Those are not necessary otherwise. Yeah, I think when we were we were talking about this the other day, one of one of you came up with the point that um, 
for some clients, it can be really useful to get the sort of market knowledge of what other DPOs or what happens in other DPO functions um, without it just being tunnel vision in this particular controller, which I think is also an interesting perspective. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh, sorry. No, no, I, I was just you know, so, sort of. I want to agree. This is probably one of the main main things you're being asked as an external DPO. Yeah. What are the others doing? How are they approaching it? Um, because uh, if you have just one company, it's often uh, more difficult to to get this uh, information on how things mm -hmm. are approaching to be in certain work circles and so on. And I know there are a lot of good ways of exchanging information between DPO, internal D DPOs as well, the groups and 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 so on. So that happens, but yeah. it's often uh, it's still quite a frequent topic that comes up. It, yeah, it can be quite isolating sometimes. Yeah. Okay. For some. So um, I want to turn now to reporting and um, before we move on to regulators, because I know everybody's going to want to know about regulators, but let's just touch on um, reporting and, and Martin, maybe you could give us a little bit of information on, you know, what, what sort of reporting goes on and, you know, who, to whom do you report and how do you report when, how frequently, what are you yeah. seeing as trends? Yeah. Um... I'll maybe I'll maybe start with the 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 kind of I guess the the to whom piece the the audience piece that uh, probably ties us back to to the previous question um, as a neat segue. I mean I think the reports will at least in my experience be delivered to a variety of people, uh, but it will typically be the the uh, general counsels or heads of compliance that we that we referenced in the the previous conversation, uh, but it. You know, it'll depend on the maybe depends on the size and the complexity of of the organisation, but you know, for the most part, it, it will go I think to to one of those two two groups. Um, other than that, it will be you know, whoever, whoever the contact may be. It may be you know HR director or whatever, but generally it's it's I think general counsel and 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 heads of compliance. Um, I've also seen um, DPO reports going um you know maybe it, it does get delivered directly to those individuals and those individual roles but uh quite often see with with some clients uh, they they like uh the reports to to go to um you know perhaps audit committees information governance committees you know again dependent on how they're structured dependent on the other on the reporting lines of that in those companies and, and and sometimes formally presented to those to those um uh, committees in addition to you know um, copies of reports being provided um and a, and a bit this is slightly more rare but i, I i've also seen some organizations um uh, look for dpo reports to go in via their um iso 27001 type you know uh, risk management committees or information uh, management um system committees that that meet on a, usually meet on a quarterly basis so they they tie in their their dpo reporting into their general uh, compliance reporting uh, that, that that gets that gets mopped up within these um, uh, ISO 27001 type frameworks. Uh, you know, particularly if you know if the company is is um, maybe a little bit smaller and and maybe um, you know where where people might have double hat double hat sometimes and and and, and share roles. So so it's it, it can come in 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 all shapes and sizes really. But yeah, you know to, to generalize, I think it is mainly going to to general counsel and and, and heads of compliance. Um, the, again, the, the reporting cycle will, will will probably depend on the size of the organisation, the, the general makeup, and possibly the risk appetite of the client as well. Um, so, the, you know, the majority, I think, would uh, majority of, of DPO reports will be delivered on a, I think, probably at least a monthly or a quarterly basis. Uh, I've seen minorities up for you know twice yearly reporting, six monthly reporting. Uh, and then probably more rarely again, you know, annual reports. So again, I don't think there's a there's a there's a hard and fast rule on this. Um, um, and and I don't I personally I I I don't know whether if either of you disagree, but I I personally don't really mind as long as the kind of reporting cadence is is consistent and 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 people stick to it. Um, and it's, you know, then you don't end up with, you know, you're supposed to be delivering a monthly report and you maybe only deliver two or three a year. Um, I would rather, you know, either stick to a quarterly or or a half monthly cycle, you know, in in, in, a, in a reporting cycle that you can actually deliver. 
and and then there's obviously that there's evidence that they, you know that to show that the DPO is monitoring what's happening. Um, in terms of content, uh, yeah, again that 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 can that can vary. So I mean, a lot of a lot of controllers just simply know what what's happening, you know, what's being delivered, what's being done. But I I personally like, uh, and I'm I'm kind of I'm I am interested in that, but I'm I'm also interested in trying to demonstrate that. Um, that in addition to the fact that things are done, that there's evidence to show things are done, and in, in, you know, in order to maintain a record, and 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 I suppose overall to to help meet and support the accountability principles. So, so some of the things I I personally like to to um, um, uh, update in 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 my reporting is you know not just the fact that you know you've had x number of incidents that were addressed but I also like to know that there's you know an up to date incident register that gets reviewed on a monthly basis two monthly basis wherever it may be similarly with um, you know data subject rights requests you know that they're being dealt with great but I also like to know that you know there's there's a a good record about how those requests were handled and 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 that there's an overall log of 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 those requests that, that that's being maintained and and similarly for for like risk assessments and DPIAs and you know good 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 supplier lists you know to to, to help demonstrate your Article 28 compliance. So I think all all of these things and I think I you know again thinking that we're what four and a half years or so down the road from the introduction of the GDPR, um, I think. DPO reporting is 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 probably starting to develop a bit of a life of its mm -hmm. own, and I would say I'm I'm seeing probably more interest in the last 18 months, maybe or, or last year, 18 months on on um, or at least an, an increased interest in in developing uh, and and maintaining you know good metrics, good KPIs in the reporting. So this, you know, could be number of incidents, um, number of DSARs, okay. DPIAs, complaints and the like. Um, and in some cases, some clients, you know, we know like to see that these are, you know, measured against some kind of, uh, you know, internal service level agreement or SLA, you know, so like looking for, for nice reports that show, you know, percentage of DSARs completed within 30 days or, or, um, or if an extension was taken, you know, within 90 days or whatever it might be. And you know, I think the kind of growing body of, of privacy tech privacy tech tools out there, I think probably can help with that. And I think these, I mean, these these metrics, you know, and arguably could sometimes can be just lots of numbers and, and potentially meaningless. But I think the the more sophisticated clients um, and the more sof sophisticated privacy teams are, are taking these these metrics turning them into good management information and and these are starting to help influence and shape you know priorities for the business you know pri priorities for the controller and, and potentially even you know investment and budgets you know so if uh, if you know the SLA on 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 responding to incidents doesn't look good you know perhaps then you know maybe that security team needs a bit more help and a bit more support and technology so so they I think that's that's some an area I'm expecting to see to, to develop, I think, in the next few years, you know, that, you know, not only are we just going to be reporting on things, but we're we're going to have some some really good measurable KPIs to actually, you know, show yeah. show how well we're doing. I think you must be right there. I mean, what, what fascinates me is that you look at this as, you know, where where would we drive the investment in, in privacy compliance? I look at it with my lawyer's hat on and think if I were a regulator, I'd be asking for evidence of this sort of thing and then chasing up, you know, where there's been failings. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, it's bound to happen, isn't it? We're going to have regulators asking for this kind of evidence of compliance accountability. Yeah. But, um, Felix, have you got any thoughts on the reporting? to senior management yes yeah, so one I, I think talk, one thing you need to talk about there is really the reporting line how high is senior management mm, is it enough true. to uh, report to a head of some other department or do you actually need to go a step higher and I think the cadence of your reporting also depends on this role. So if you're really reporting to senior management or even you know, eventually reporting to a board member or maybe actually have certain board meetings you'd attend in your function as a DPO, then you probably wouldn't report to them uh, once a, a week. Um, and yeah. uh, that's more 
uh, towards this yearly reporting where you summarize the main issues and say, okay, we've got three things you, you really need to look at in your company, and those are the three issues. Um, that's one side of the reporting, and then the, obviously there's sort of this daily one where, like Martin's approach, can we work with KPIs just to show how the work is actually how the money, whether the money is well spent, um, and whether it's um, you know it's it's working uh, uh, well. But uh, uh, I think the reporting and the quality of and, and the nature of the reporting depends on whom you report to. Mm. Okay. And in terms of, um, I mean, we're talking here about sort of reporting, kind of regimented in a way, but. The function behind, well, one of the functions behind a DPO is to alert the business to serious issues. So, so how does a DPO make that sort of connection at the right level to, let's say, the board, so that he or she is able to, when necessary, communicate something that is sufficiently serious that maybe it doesn't, it shouldn't go through the reporting line because it's urgent and it's serious and it must be done. How do you how do you do that? Yeah, so first off, I think one of the main qualities of a DPO or the main challenges for the DPO is really building your network within the company and having those contacts, knowing who's going to inform me, who's going to give me the information I need, and whom can I turn to if I need to get something really to move. And there's no this is exactly the way you do it solution. The only thing is you need to have a strong network or uh, contact and know how to get things moving. And sometimes it is really in turning to to the board more or less directly if you're, you know, if, if that channel is there. Sometimes it could be that you just know how to make certain things happen on the technical side and so on. So building this re those relationships is a good thing and what I'm seeing more and more that ties back into how do you organize a DPO is that uh, when companies have a data governance group and and, and that's something that I'm seeing uh, developing it's uh, data governance is a big topic plus all those data acts coming from Brussels uh, in uh, extending privacy and data protection beyond personal data into other areas uh, and this being looked at this is where you get people together and knowing who are going to work with you in those groups are is probably relevant for escalating something if you need to quickly yeah um, i mean yes yeah, when i answered your question initially as i was kind of thinking more of the, the formal reporting rather than yeah, sure, sure. that, that yeah, kind yeah. of soft soft reporting on the day-to-day -day level and, and and of course felix right there you know there's you know like any i suppose like any uh role within a company you, you've got to map and know your know your stakeholders and and and, and get to know them and, and know where to escalate things so you know if if there's a serious incident you know I, you know at least i don't think any of us would be afraid of going directly to our cios or ceos or whoever it may be you know to say you know we've got a serious incident here that that, that needs to be notified to a regulator um so you know that that ability to to pick up a phone or or you know to have a chat with somebody over a coffee you know is 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 important and 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 that kind of soft reporting is is you know, you, mm -hmm. you, you know sometimes you just got to escalate it when you you need to the the other the other way i've seen seen it done which is you know it's a bit more structured and a bit more formal as well which is not strictly kind of connected to the the formal uh reporting process although it can be linked in it and, and i've seen some organizations again those with kind of very strong risk management frameworks within the organization where um you know it, dpo says something that gets added to a risk register that you know gets added to a corporate risk register and and feeds its way up the chain to to, to management that way where it, you know it will be formally reviewed but um but yeah i think you know it, there's nothing stopping us picking up the phone or contacting someone in the event that you know we've got something serious in front of us okay well that brings us neatly on to regulators <laughs> and um and obviously one of the dpo's functions is to be that link to the regulators um so how does a what, what does a dpo do in in regulator interactions and I'm I'm going to turn to Felix first because something tells me that he may have more regulator interactions than we do. So Felix, how does it work in Germany? 
Yeah, it, it, it certainly depends on the regulator you're talking about. Um, <laughs> oh, okay. Some, because some regulators really like to meet and and discuss things and are open to picking up uh, to to actually taking calls and mm. uh, resolving issues or meeting and talking about products and talk about the companies and, and happy to um, do so. Others are more reluctant to have those meetings and prefer a more formal approach. And depending on which country you're talking about, you you have different um, different settings there or approaches. Mm -hmm. uh, so what we often try to do, depending on whether there's appetite on the side of the, our clients to do so, is really to have a, an initial meeting with a regulator and introduce a product and show what we're doing, uh, just um, to show at the same time, you know, there is a data protection officer in place and, and this company is taking privacy serious. Um, and so if ever there is an incident and everyone will have an incident eventually, uh, there is a data incident, then you will ha uh, have a certain level of trust that has been built up with a regulator. That's really helpful. They will know you're generally really trying to be compliant and this may just be a mishap rather than you're the one who's dodging away and trying to avoid the light, uh, sort of, uh, so to speak, or that contact. The other thing is, if you have something to report again, uh, and there is some contact required with the uh, with the regulator, uh, it may be very helpful to involve your data protection officer, your internal data or external data protection officer, from the start, uh, from the outset, and and channels of communication through the DPO because that's showing that the role of the DPO in the company is taken serious and uh, whether that's true or not is another question but it's at least showing the attempt uh, that the DPO is involved in those topics and so that's a good story to tell that's why it should be going through this one. Okay and Martin can you give us an idea from the kind of well, we, we, the regulators you normally deal with, which would probably be the ICO and, and, and the Data Protection Commissioner in, in Ireland. Yeah, that, that's right, Hazel. Yeah, it's, for me, it's my, my, my kind of most uh, direct experience has been with the uh, ICO in the UK and uh, Data Protection Commission, DPC in, in, in Dublin. Um, I mean, how I, I kind of often think the role of the DPO here is is a wee bit like being a marriage counselor uh, or, or negotiator. You, you effectively end up being the middle person between you know, the business or controller, the yeah. the regulator, and and, and the complainant. Um, and you know, we're often you know, we're obviously the, the focal point or liaison point between um, between those various parties. Um, and probably you know, general comments. I mean, there's and it's maybe maybe more true on the on the UK side. I think there's there's almost a kind of sense of relief. I think when 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 the DPO contact is you know is, is contacted and actually responds. Um, my 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 perception is that you know once that happens, then the ICO will will effectively delegate and divest responsibility onto that DPO to to actually to deal with the complaint directly, and and you know they'll only really get involved again in the event that. You know the the complainant isn't isn't happy with the outcome, or there's a kind of further complaint around that. So, uh, in my experience, at least as well with with, with Ireland, um, it's slightly different. Where sometimes it's, it's, it's like the the DPC will act as a kind of further go between. So they'll they will liaise directly with the the complainant, and they'll also liaise with with you as DPO, who in turn liaises with the business. And so there's sometimes there's no direct communication between between us as DPO and the complainant not always but sometimes that that's that, that's the way it's been structured in, in, in my experience um, but I think you know e even in the event that there is a, a, a further complaint from a complainant e even if you you and the controller thinks that uh, the issue's been addressed I think the, both the UK and Irish regulators seem to they, they seem to generally respect that you know a, a final response that comes from a DPO as as long as there's a you know a clear narrative to tell and and there's evidence to support it. So so for example, um, you know um, you know if if the if the complaint or the the issue was around say um, 
data being withheld as part of a, a subject access request because it's you know it was it was exempt due to a legal privilege exemption in the data protection act as long as you know you you, you can demonstrate uh, that there's some rigor and and and, and evidence behind the th and the thought process that led to the to the uh, review of the complaint and the outcome of the complaint, then I think generally the the regulators will will, will look favorably on that. At least again, in my experience, you know uh, where where complaints findings have been disputed, uh, the ICO or DPC haven't taken it further. But you know as long as they can see a DPO has reviewed it and they've come to you know hopefully a sensible conclusion. Based on some evidence, so so that that's that's been quite encouraging so far. And again, and, and for breaches, you know, again, you you will you will generally act as that liaison point um, for the regulator. Uh, and maybe the difference between that and 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 the complaints is that you know you will you, you perhaps as DPO will will have, be much more hands on when it comes to um, contacting the regulator, liaising with them, perhaps helping you know draft the notifications, etc. And um, but yeah, again, similar similar kind of conclusion. As long as you can, you know, you, you you can present you know a clear narrative with evidence to show how things have developed or or you know plans to to address any issues that have come through a, through a, an incident. Then you know I think if it's coming from the DPO, I think uh, you know the regulators have, have you know have respected that. So a good advert for making sure your DPO is actually doing the communication with the regulator. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Okay, so we're we're coming up towards the end of the webinar. I have uh, one more question that I wanted to to pose and this is really to all of us before we move to questions from attendees. And that is, let's get our crystal balls out and just gaze into the future and say, you know, what's happening to the role of the DPO over, let's say, I don't know, the next four or five years. And, you know, we have we have cases. Um, maybe we have developments in how compliance is dealt with in a business. Uh, in the UK, we have the potential for new legislation, which might you know, if you look at the headlines, remove the DPO role. But then when you read in between, you see that the DPO role is removed, but replaced by a senior responsible individual. So, you know, maybe you end up with someone carrying out pretty much the same functions, even assuming we get to that position. But let's uh, maybe have a chat about where we think that yeah. the DPO role might go. So who is wants it? to kick off? Well, I, I mean, this is maybe slightly unfair in you, Hazel, but I was, I was going to slightly turn the tables on you and say what, what you know, I'd like, I suspect our audience would like to know what you think about you know, the, the, the UK plans, for example. Well, you know, who knows where the UK will go? Uh, we, we have, uh, shall we just say, we may have bigger fish to fry to sort out. But, um, you know, if the UK government gets itself organised, I can see it being very tempting to the UK government to do something about data protection law. It would probably be seen as, you know, here is our opportunity to put our stamp on data protection law rather than the European stamp and show one of the benefits of Brexit, for example. So I can see that happening. Um, I can't see it happening imminently. Um, so I think it's several years away. And I can't see it happening in such a radical fashion that we would lose our adequacy from the EU because I think the UK government would see that as being a big issue. So it's a bit like, dare I say it, moving the deck chairs around on the Titanic. I mean, that's probably the wrong image to give for the UK, but that's that boat, you see, as they, they, <laughs> you would be caught my eye. And, uh, you know, we would be, we'd still have a DPO function. We just wouldn't call it a DPO function. And it would enable, I think, the UK government to say, we have relaxed the requirement for DPOs on very small businesses. That's, I think, how it would would pan out. So okay. I think it's it's, the need is still there for large businesses slash businesses handling a lot of data. And so I don't see that going away and I don't see why it would be in a, to the benefit of the UK to remove that function completely. So that's, I think it's still here. We might rename it, but it's still in the UK. Um, what do you guys think? What, where do you think the DPO role is going over the next few years? So I, I see a tendency 
in general towards using more tools or towards more accountability and more professionalization of the job so there has we've seen that in the last couple of years and i think this is where things are heading um the other part is that the, the um, various regulators have said they will investigate or they will have one of the main focuses of their work in investigating whether the DPO role and whether that has been embedded correctly mm. in companies. So we'll see some of those investigations in the next year. I'm pretty sure, in my view, this is mainly going to be a more formal approach. So probably something like those questionnaires going out. What are you doing about the DPO? How, where are they reporting? Questions like that. So really checking those formalities is going to be important um, rather than going into the uh, nitty gritty of, of the everyday work. But uh, that's where we'll see pressure, protect particularly on the independence of, um, of the DPO. In my view, the importance is just going to rise and be higher than rather lower. Mm. I was interested to see, I mean, I've not, obviously not, I've not read the whole decision in the original language, but there was a decision from the Luxembourg Supervisory Authority on a DPO and um, how the controller had not provided sufficient resources and support for the DPO, which I thought was quite interesting that, you know, we're, we're starting to see regulators input on the kind of support um, uh, that a DPO should have in order to do his or her job properly. Um, that's quite significant, I think. And, you know, as you say, maybe that will come up under the EDPB review. Martin, what, what, what do you see happening in the next four or five years? Yeah, I, I, I might I say doing... it to your job. <laughs> to job yeah. I might, I might become a, what, what was it, a senior responsible individual <laughs> here in the UK rather than a, than a DPO. Yeah. Um, I mean, I mean, you, you, you've both covered, I think, on the, on the kind of bigger picture regulatory yeah. side. So, you know, I, I don't think I need to go there. But I think probably on a more on a day to day level, I, you know, there's. I think there's a general sense that um, you know it, it is uh, the, the role is is almost becoming more like a an, an audit type function. You know the the kind of the reporting cycles, the, the the review of policies, the checking. You know it is it is it feels to me increasingly like you know at least three or four times a year for multiple clients. You know where you're you're essentially kicking the tires and, and and just making sure that you know people are doing what they they say they're doing and 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 and, and taking um you know taking steps to address that um so that i think that that's only going to, going to increase yeah. i mean the, the other the other area where i see a lot of my time starting to shift and actually i probably should have covered this in the in the faqs bit but it is i think it is more of a recent development and it's it's that kind of endless discussion around retention of records and management information or kind of more broadly information governance and I think at least you know in my day-to-day -day over the last little while and I think increasingly so we're, we're going to be spending a lot more time focusing and and advising on on um, you know information governance type issues and, and and helping organizations decide how to protect the personal data um, you know and, and you know and potentially how to secure it archive it and then eventually destroy it um, appropriately so that that may be you know one of the day-to-day -day shifts that are coming okay so i uh, we've had a few questions come in just in the last few moments and i don't think we're going to be able to give true justice to them so we might have to respond to those by email um, sorry for those people who've been asking, but there was one slightly earlier, which I think we I can pose to both of you and get you to to give like a one sentence answer. And this is um, the question is as follows: We find that in-house departments often come to the DPO asking for a preemptive solution, and looks to the DPO to carry the burden of making a call when any risk-based approach is involved. Do you see this behavior and how do you put the responsibility back to the business? So, Felix, you're the first face on my screen, so you get the first the first one sentence answer. OK, uh, well, the very first short uh, answer is yes, we see that all the time. Um, mm -hmm. Absolutely. And it's uh, it's really about making clear what your role is. And it's an advisory role. So you can while you can certainly 
come up with your risk assessment and tell them this is what I think uh, how it should be done. You should also make clear to business this is you know, and provide them with potential solutions. At the same time, um, the, the last call is with the business, and you've got to be, be absolutely clear about it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's Martin? it's the same for me. It's it, yeah, it, it's yes, I see it, and 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 yes, you know, I. I just remind the person making the request that mine is an, an advisory role and it's not for me to make decisions. I can only recommend and advise. Okay. Well, thank you very much, both of you. We are at time and thank you very much for joining us. Um, I hope that was helpful. Hope you enjoyed the questions. Apologies to those people who've asked questions that we've not managed to answer, but we will email you some answers. Uh, we will also send you a link to this recording. And please do join us uh, for our next webinar, um, which is in early December, and it's a review of the year just passed and uh, looking forward to the coming year. So thank you very much, and uh, thank you, Felix and Martin. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.